good morning to all of you. Let's uh, talk about approach to patient with hemiplegia and paraplegia today. And I hope I am audible to all of you. So, Am I audible to you? I do not find any response to what I'm asking you. Are you able to hear me, please? All right, as I understand uh, from this, I think you people can hear me. Uh, and I'm sharing my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Or you are sharing or presenting a case? So I'm in, you opened your case. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning, sir. I'm audible. Yeah, yeah. So are you presenting a case? Yes, sir. I'm presenting the case. I'm Ruby. Okay, then, uh, you know, share your screen. Yeah, I can see your screen. Go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, good morning, sir. I will present the case on hemiplegia. Should I start? 
yeah 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 start please uh, good morning everyone uh, i'm presenting the case of 60 years old gentleman who is resident of greater noida shopkeeper by occupation he is 12 fast and a right handed person teeth complaint weakness in left upper and lower limb from past 6 days uh, deviation of We lost your voice. Yeah, carry on. We're not able to hear you now. Are you having problem in uh, running through your slides? I am not able to hear you. So now I am audible. Yeah, now you are audible. ठीक है आप Are you using a laptop or you're using a phone? The laptop. Oh, okay. So when he developed weakness on left side and upper and lower limb, that was sudden and onset. He fell down when he got up from the bed in morning. About four hours later, the incident. Patient was unable to raise his left hand above his shoulder, unable to comb his hair. He was unable to do squatting, get up from sitting position, slipping of slippers from foot, and unable to do buttoning of his shirt. Weakness is more marked in upper limb as compared to lower limb, as complained by patient. There is slurring of speech for six days, sudden and onset, gradual, progressive over few hours, and has been static since then. Patient also complains of drooling of saliva, deviation of angle of mouth while eating, speaking, and deviation of tongue toward left side on attempting protrusion. The negative history. No, uh, no history of altered sensorium, loss of consciousness, seizures, and abnormal behavior associated to event, absence of abnormal movement, no loss of smell, blurring of vision, double vision, tingling, vertigo, deafness, no hoarseness of voice, regurgitation of food particles, no history of fever, neck rigidity, palpitation, dyspnea, chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, headache, nausea, vomiting, and no waxing and waning of symptoms. Uh, and past history. No history of such episodes in past. Uh, no history of trauma. Patient is a known case of hypertension from past ten years. On treatment with poor compliance. Patient is a known case of uh, patient is not a known case of diabetes asthma. Patient has never suffered from tuberculosis. And no history of cardiac interventions or surgery. Personal history. Patient has a vegetarian diet. Normal bowel and bladder activity and takes adequate sleep. There is a history of cigarette smoking, 30 plus years for last 30 years. Family history: His brother is a known case of hypertension. Drug history: Patient is presently on anti-hypertension medication with poor compliance. No history of anticoagulant intakes. No history of any drug abuse. Socio-economic history: No uh, low socio-economic uh, family according to modified Kupuswami scale. 
vitals patient no, is no, conscious stop. hold on hold on hold on so okay. everyone has heard the history uh so to recapitulate you should just summarize it uh sir it just summarize it sir uh, my patient 60 years old male who is a known case of six uh, who is a known case of hypertension presented with weakness in left upper and lower limb and deviation of angle of mouth to right side with slurring of speech for past 6 days on uh, Well, that's all right. That's all. So presenting with that, so typical scenario of a. Sir, what do you think? The complete hemiplegia. Sorry, I. Side. Hemiplegia of left side. So I mean, you are saying hemiplegia or hemiparesis of the left side, and he's a known case of hypertension, and it occurred at what time of the day? That is very important. Sir, you did not take that history. In the, uh, sir, in the morning he fell down from the bed. So morning when? What was he doing at that time? Ah, uh, sir, at six a.m. getting up from bed. I mean, when he got up from the bed, he fell down immediately. Yes, sir. So he had got up and he tried to get up and he fell down. That's what you said. Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, you said that there is more weakness in the upper limb than in the lower limb. Is that right? Yes, sir. Sir, as told by patient. As told by patient. How did you confirm this? What he is saying by asking what points in the history? How would you confirm that? Rather before examining, how would you confirm this? Sir, like he is unable to raise his hand above head, or like for doing pounding and cutting. That's okay. But how do you say this is more weakness in the upper limb than in the lower limb? So in history, what are you going to ask? So one way of asking in that situation would be whether he is able to stand up, yes. isn't it? So if he is able to stand up, that means power in the lower limb would be high, more than in the upper limb. If you are finding that he is not able to raise his head and above the shoulder and all that can yes. it be a local problem shoulder joint problem also that he is not able to raise his hands above yes sir yes sir yes, then how uh, do you correlate it with the how do you correlate it with the weakness or the sir, deviation but, uh, of the angle of along, the mouth yes sir but it along with the raising of hand uh, he can't do like any working of the uh, but more starting combing and this the moments we it's not like sorry sorry speak very speak clearly i am not able to hear you what are you saying along with raise, not able to raise at hand what is he having sir unable to do buttoning and combing and the fine work okay so distal muscle. distal fine movements are also affected yes. so it is not only a proximal weakness of the upper limb but also the distal, distal weakness also. similar history you can take if he is able to get up and stand that means weakness in the lower limb is not that much as much as it is there in the upper limb and then if he is able to walk then what will you what will suggest you that he has distal weakness more in the lower limb and less or uh, uh, distal weakness is also there in the lower, lower limb or not how what what history would he give So uh, if distal, uh, distal limb may, if the lower limb may like there is more weakness, so he was unable to stand up. But uh, no, a stand can. up. So he may, if, if his weakness, proximal muscle weakness is not much, then he may be able to stand up. Sir, he will keep his power in the hip joints and knee joints is more than three plus, then he may be able to stand up. It's slipping of slippers. Uh, history of slipping oh, of slippers. Oh yes, so he's. not able to hold his slippers if he is wearing them and isn't it or or if he is sitting and you find that there is a foot drop isn't it yes if there is a foot drop or slipping of chappals that will give you always a history of distal weakness all right yes, it it may occur because of the muscles of the ankle joints getting involved more that area getting involved more anyhow so that is one aspect the other thing you said that he has also a slurring of speech for past 6 days 
What yes. do you mean by slurring of speech? In history, sir, you have to take uh, full details. Yes, sir. Like uh, he said, uh, like बोलने में दिक्कत है. So then you must say like slurring of speech. नहीं, जब बोलने में दिक्कत है, you have to take further history. What kind of the difficulty in speaking? Sir, uh, problem is in the, articulation. Problem in articulation. Okay. So there is no problem in comprehension. No, sir. So in speech, you all should understand there are two basic components. One is comprehension, and other is articulation or expression. So if the comprehension is good, how do you test comprehension of speech? Sir, like we can ask him uh, what he do for living and where he where he lives. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You speak slowly, and so when you speak like this, that means you are not confident of what you are trying to say. To speak slowly the way I am speaking. Sir, we can. So how do you know that the comprehension? How do you know that the comprehension is good? When you are taking history, how do you know? You don't. Yes. Sir, we can ask the patient like the uh, for the comprehension like where did he live? Whether. Where did he live? What he do for living? Like what he do for like occupation? I mean, you are asking him general questions. That that live. What is he doing for living is not critical. What are you saying that whatever you tell him, is he responding adequately or not? Yes. That sir. is comprehension. So that means auditory part is okay. Further, you can also look for the visual component. You can ask him if he is if he can read or write. He can read something. You give him something to read. Is he able to read or not? That is one aspect. Mm -hmm. What other aspect of comprehension you you will test? So, like we can show him the pen and ask him like what is the name for me. Then we can yeah, check for name. Identifying the object. Identifying the objects, yes. Uh, and then, sir, we can uh, check for repetition by giving him four to five words and ask him to repeat. Mm hmm. That's for uh, that's more for memory. But anyhow, yes. So if he is able to understand, you assign him a particular task. You ask him, can you lift this pan from here? And he lifts it, maybe with his other hand. the right hand is weak then he can do. all right so his yes. comprehension is good you said the problem is in articulation so if yes. there is a problem in articulation where the problem is likely to be uh, at the level 12th now involvement hypertrophy at the level of muscle 12 uh, tongue muscle 12th now as as the problem will be only in the nerves it cannot be so higher up uh, it's like due, due to the involvement of uh, muscle Like no, so involved mm -hmm. muscles can happen because of both regions. Na, they can be lower motor neuron region. They can be upper, upper. motor neuron region also. Yes, so you sir. cannot say that it is only lower motor neuron. Dysarthria can be central dysarthria. There can be peripheral dysarthria. So what is dysarthria is same as this articulation. So what mm -hmm. is the difference between peripheral dysarthria and central dysarthria? Uh, yeah. Have you heard the sir, term called as pseudo bulbar palsy and bulbar palsy? Sir, yes, sir. Pseudo bulbar palsy. So, pseudo bulbar uh, palsy is what? Central or pseudo bulbar palsy is peripheral? Sir, uh, it's an upper motor neuron region. Uh, yeah. Palsy. Yeah, and bulbar palsy is considered as lower motor neuron. Lower motor neuron. Region. Yeah. So. So dysarthria can be because of the, so why should he have dysarthria when he doesn't have any, according to your history, any regurgitation, no nine, ten, eleven, twelfth of involvement, no tongue deviation. So why should he have dysarthria? Sir, because the uh, the tongue has a uh, the tongue doesn't have the bilateral supply from the twelfth uh, out. So. so? So, like, if if there is problem on left side and the nerve of the right side has been gone, so left side become uh, weak. There is no other supply for that. No, no. Where is the where is the indication that there is a left side twelfth nerve involvement? You are just saying deviation of the angle of mouth. He is complaining. Yes, sir. That is due to the. But he is not complaining of any nasal regurgitation. 
He is not complaining of any nasal twang, isn't it? Yes, sir. So then, how can you say that there is nine, tenth, eleventh involvement or twelfth involvement? He is not. Is there any deviation of the tongue also? This you will examine not on history, but you can still get yes, some sir, history. So that history is lacking in your. So these lot of points in your history are lacking. You have to go into depth of these. Sir, uh, we wrote that point in the uh, history of presenting illness about that term. Sorry. Sir, we wrote the uh, term protrusion point in the history of presenting illness. Huh? Sorry, Sir, repeat it again. Sir? Yeah. Sir, I am audible. Sir, we wrote. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Term protrusion point is there in history of presenting illness. There is some extra sound coming when you are speaking. Anyhow, you are saying that in the history of presenting illness, there is history of tongue. Tongue protrusion. Tongue. The uh, tongue deviation on protrusion. There is a history. Is there a history like that? Sir, your uh, last the patient also complained of drooling of saliva, deviation of angle of mouth while eating, speaking. And deviation of tongue toward left side on attempting to On attempting to protrude. Okay, so that suggests twelfth nerve. But is the twelfth nerve involved in speech? Speech. Sir, for articulation. Twelfth is there needed for that? Is only for certain vowels or something? Is not required for. A, what is more required is nine tenth. Isn't it? Yes. So you said there is a deviation of tongue to a left side on attempting to protrusion. Can it be a false deviation? Whenever there is a seventh nerve involvement, there can be a false deviation. Can it be or not? There can always be that situation when there is a seventh nerve involvement, you may find slight tongue deviation. But anyhow, on protrusion, if it is so, if he is able to protrude, that means there is no paralysis of the tongue. He will not be able to protrude the tongue. All yes, right, twelfth nerve involvement, protrusion of the tongue would be affected. It is yes. only when opening the mouth and you see tongue deviated to one side or atrophy of the tongue although within six days it would not occur it will take few weeks so yes, on a 12th nerve involvement protrusion of the tongue is practically ruled out you won't be able to protrude your tongue you can see a tongue lying with the open mouth on one side if there is a 12th nerve involvement protrusion of tongue would be very very difficult yes you got my point yes as you said that there is no bilateral innervation is not like seventh now yes isn't it anyhow so then then some of come to your some negative points please yeah so you are now here saying that there is no history of caesar why did you take history of caesar here or loss uh, of consciousness or loss of sensorium. What all those absence of all these suggest what? Sir, cortical involvement to, in order to rule out the cortical involvement. Cortical. All right, very good. That if there is no cerebral cortex involvement, chances of seizures are practically nil. Chances of loss of consciousness are also less. All right, so it yes. rules out predominantly mainly cerebral cortex involvement. Yes. What else? Pulls out a cerebral cortex involvement besides these these features. So, like we can ask for uh, in raised intracranial uh, tension features like for that's, that's okay. That's okay. That is one point. Anything else in this patient you think rules out a cortex involvement? Yes. Anything else? So the important points you have already enumerated altered sensorium loss of consciousness or seizures 
when they are not there that means cerebral cortex is not involved all right but on other hand if you find have you heard the term called as dense hemiplegia yes sir at the level of internal capsule there is a lesion yes so when there is a almost i i mean in here in this case you're not not saying me whether it is complete on examination we will know whether there is complete weakness on the left side or not but in case there is complete weakness without loss of consciousness that further points to a dense hemiplegia and once this is a dense hemiplegia uh uh the uh, without loss of consciousness because if there is a dense hemiplegia involving the cortex then you can imagine that whole cortex on the frontal lobe on the median aspect isn't it the areas is too huge to not yes. to produce a loss of consciousness for a had it been just a slight weakness in the upper limb and slight deviation of angle of mouth no weakness in the lower limb all right yes one would have still thought that maybe a small area of cortex is involved without loss of consciousness without even seizure okay but yes. if there is a dense hemiplegia and there is no loss of consciousness no seizure activity then it is most likely a below cortex below site cortex. for the localization okay yes. why did you take the history of uh, uh, neck rigidity here Sir, to rule out the infectious causes like meningitis. Sorry. Sir, to rule out the infectious causes like meningitis. So you think his history suggests that? No, no sir, but he rule out like infectious so causes. So with... that, but that's not right, na? If the history is so typical, you have to be even very rational in choosing negative histories. sometimes i find there are only two positive history described and there are 50 negative histories taken that's irrelevant here taking history of neck rigidity and fever is little irrelevant when you have typical history why have you taken the history of all these uh, for cardiac and respiratory things things all these palpitation yes, dyspnea chest pain cough hemoptysis yes what sir, were you expecting uh... if there is cardiac uh, problem then there will be can uh, embolism what kind of cardiac problem what kind the, of like in the atrial fibrillation so ischemic heart disease ischemic Hyper heart disease hypertensive heart disease valvular heart disease arrhythmia what are you, what what else what is coming to your mind ansan uh, infective endocarditis which can also uh, the cause of embolism for the why would you think of of infective endocarditis in this situation the history would be very difficult very different sorry yes so all these points are from my point of view are irrelevant in a patient who is a known hypertensive gets up in the morning and suddenly finds he is not able to move his left side of the body and deviation of the mouth is very mm -hmm. only only history i would take is no history of palpitation because if he has had suddenly some arrhythmia causing palpitation and had a stroke that too is very unlikely in a patient with a known hypertension until unless the hypertension has caused hypertensive heart disease significant hypertrophy and enlargement of the chamber till that point arrhythmias do not occur so it is an extreme long standing hypertension producing marked dilatation of the chambers that may predispose to someone having an arrhythmia otherwise even that history of all these is irrelevant i would not think of a ischemic heart disease producing it like this ischemic heart disease producing hemiplegia would only occur in case there is a thrombotic episode going on which is causing ischemia in the coronary vessel ischemia in the cerebral vessels yes. there the history would be very different your history of chest pain not just sudden chest pain but yes acute mi sometimes can come with an acute stroke both together all right but that history is not there i mean so taking just history of chest pain and palpitation we okay but taking history of neck rigidity 
dyspnea, hemoptysis, they are irrelevant. All right. Yes. So you have to rationalize your these histories also. Okay. okay. Any questions from your side in history? What we have analyzed? Um, if sir, none, then sir. proceed further. No. If none, then proceed further. Come to examination. Any of your friends have anything they should write on the chat? Sir, uh, I will ask them. Sorry? Sir, I will ask them for their question because uh, and you can check their yeah, in the question go. box. The vitals? Yeah, carry on. Uh, patient is conscious, oriented to time, place, and person, lying on bed. Consent for examination is taken. So the height is 160 centimeter, weight 60 kg, BMI 23.4. Pulse okay. uh, So, what is your comment on the BMI? Is it okay? Uh, uh, so, what's the uh, obese fat, obese size? He's obese. And, yes. 23.4 23.4 is a normal limit yeah it is normal yes, okay pulse rate 76 beats per minute rhythm regular volume normal no no uh, no radio radio radial and radio femoral delay not appreciated condition of vessel wall not palpable peripheral pulse is palpable uh, blood pressure 146 by 90 mm of hg in right cricle artery in supine position Temperature, if you try to touch, respiratory rate 16 times per minute, abdominal thoracic, accessory muscle not prominent. The general physical examination, pallor, if the sinus is not appreciated, no lymphedema pathogen, no apparent so rubbing on nothing, nothing in the general physical examination significant. Yes, sir. All right. So, my question now is in a patient who comes with this kind of presentation, what specifically you would like to see in general physical examination? Anything very specific? So, like uh, we can check for atrophic changes. Atrophic changes where? Uh, at the uh, muscle atrophy. Uh, upper six upper days, upper in six days, does it occur? Uh, no, sir. History given is only six days. It does not occur before three weeks. Four weeks of disuse. Sir, we can look for gait of the patient. How is it walking? Good. Gait is one, but that becomes part of nervous system examination also. But okay. Anything else? Anything else relevant? A patient with long standing hypertension can have what? On general physical examination. Anything from head to toe? Anything you think? There can be generalized edema. Uh, pedal edema. Yes. Pedal so edema. Most important thing is pedal edema because of two reasons. One, drug induced because of the very commonly used drug like. Any guesses? Amlodipine. Amlodipine is notorious for producing pedal edema. All right. So this one calcium channel blocker and most of them does produce some pedal edema in a lot of patients on long-term use. That's one thing. Or pedal edema without that can be because of a hypertensive heart disease, which ultimately leads to you have left ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular uh, uh, dilatation, back pressure, right-sided system, you're, you're not able to, and the pedal edema may occur. So one is pedal edema, very important. Anything else in these patients? You would like to see? So long-standing hypertensive patient may have. Can there be some changes elsewhere seen in the General physical examination. 
what happens to the pulse characters or vessel wall what happens to the vessel wall uh, the things are taking a vessel wall uh, stiffening yeah at significant atherosclerosis setting in can lead to some hardening of the vessel vessels the hardening of the vessels when you feel them they are not okay that may occur anyhow let's go to the next slide Rishikesh, will we like to continue from here? Okay. System examination, uh, central nervous yeah. system examination. Uh, first, we we did uh, higher mental function. Patient is conscious, oh. oriented to time, place, and person, cooperative, and follows commands. Hearing uh, oh. of speech is uh, present, but intact naming, repetition is present, and patient is able to comprehend. A memory repetition is there repetition is there you are saying yes sir okay no but uh, you said intact naming repetition and comprehension okay all right yes so how did you test this now this slurring of speech is occurring because of uh is is disaster you are saying Yes, so, what kind of dysarthria is this? Peripheral or central? Central. So central. Central, central dysarthria. Sorry? Central, sir. CT? CT. So, you are saying peripheral. Why are you saying peripheral? Yes, the central dysarthria. Sorry? Sir, I'm saying it's central dysarthria due to involvement of the nerves. Central dysarthria. Okay. Let's yeah, we'll talk about it later. Go ahead. Memory you have written intact, immediate, short and long. Yes, sir. So how do you test memory? Sir, immediate memory is that Tell me we... how would you test immediate memory, how would you test short and how would you test long memory? Just give me in one minute the answer to all these. Sir, we'll uh, tell the patient to memorize uh, any random object or name and, and then we'll tell him to repeat it and then we'll ask you uh, when then we'll ask uh, the patient after some time that, like five minutes uh, that would be a short that is, uh, short that is for which type of memory short memory sir uh, asking after short. Uh, Achha, and for immediate immediate <laughs> sir we tell the patient patient and uh, then we asked immediately after uh, telling the patient so what is the difference between immediate and short? Sir, in immediate Anyone memory, else has a better answer? Sir. Yeah. Sir, in immediate, we ask like, uh, immediately to, uh, to the patient after giving the word for the short uh, memory call. We ask after five minutes. And in short memory? But in short memory, we ask after five minutes, and in long memory, we can ask for like this life event uh, when he gets married. Where, where, where is it written that you ask after five minutes becomes a short memory? What is the sir, source sir. of your information? Sir, in immediate, we ask after five minutes. In short, we can ask uh, about what he had in meal yesterday or like. Uh, exactly. That is what it is. That is what is the right answer I wanted. So, immediate is you may give him four or five names or some objects name and all that and then after five minutes you suddenly ask them repeat those names that is immediate short term would be if you are examining at 11 o'clock in the day ask him what did he have for his breakfast or what did he have for previous night dinner and the long-term memory is events of significance in his or her life all right of his education or of his marriage or of his birth of his child or something and something like those or any events okay yes, so that's the difference between immediate and short it's not that within five minutes you do it is either immediate or short both got my point yes so you give them some few names of an objects or anything while you are taking history and after four or five minutes or say ten minutes even or two three minutes 
uh, you keep on asking or doing something more and then ask him again to repeat those names that is immediate memory the short term would be what he did in the morning what did he eat or if you're taking history in the evening what did he eat for the lunch all right something like that and long term memory as i told you okay let's go ahead with the cranial nerve examination cranial all nerves uh, all factory optic you have written is okay third fourth sixth is okay trigeminal is okay facial yes, now describe the facial sir uh, facial nerve motor wrinkling on forehead is present is able to close eyelids uh, absence of nasolabial folds on the left side deviation of uh, mouth uh, deviation of angle folds of the mouth the left side uh, towards Lost the right your side voice. hello uh. is deviation of angle of the mouth to the right side yeah, and yeah. is not, and not able to blow air properly due to loss of vaccinator vaccinator's weakness so this is just what type of facial nerve involved sir it's an upper motor neuron facial pathway suitable mm -hmm. why upper motor neuron type uh, sir because the the wrinkling on forehead is present and in the person is able to close eye so that means lower half is involved only not the complete one side of the face yes sir okay so why why it happens like this in upper motor sir, neuron uh, sir uh, there is uh, the uh, facial nerve divides into upper and lower half the upper half has bilateral supply while the lower half uh, has only contralateral supply okay. uh, bilateral innervation that's why in a umn lesion you get only lower half affected that is the answer yes 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 okay go ahead next vestibular next, next slide sir uh, <coughs> can you see yeah. vestibular cochlear yes yes uh, vestibular cochlear uh, on weber test equally heard on both side gloss of pharyngeal and vagus uh, test of a uh, posterior one third of the tongue is present uvula is central in position normal gag reflex no dysphagia or and uh, regurgitation spinal accessory nerve uh, trapezius and sternocleidomastoid uh, adequate power is present all right so 11th 9th 10th 8th 9th 10th 11th all are good okay <laughs> come to the 12th hypoglossal nerve on attempting protrusion the tongue deviates to the left side atrophy and fasciculation of tongue no okay so there is 12th nerve involvement also yes so so what you should be saying as we were discussing that on protrusion attempting the protrusion you should also write the patient is not able to protrude but tongue deviates to the well, left side uh, yes okay yes sir. all right so 7th and 12th both so why yes, in in a typical internal capsule hemiplegia 7th and 12th nerve get involved what are the most common nerves get involved in a typical internal capsule hemiplegia what is the most common 7th what is the most common 7th nerve sir facial nerve seventh is the most common in a classical internal capsule hemiplegia lesion and hemiplegia where the lesion is in the internal capsule and the second most common is the 12th now yes why is it so if you recollect the anatomical drawing of the internal capsule and the fibers placed then you would know there is an internal there is an anterior limb and there is a posterior limb yes. isn't it yes so where what is the placement of fibers in these limbs how is it play how are they placed okay i will i can I, i think i might show you something in the slide or we can so that's the reason that they find okay let's the motor system motor system muscle bulk in upper limb 10 cm 10 cm above the medial epicondyle uh muscle bulk the, uh, the muscle bulk is all all right okay very good so you have to ensure that you take a bony prominence and from there take equal distance 
on either side either of the limb to measure the bulb all right so that's what you have done tubal tuberosity or upper border of patella and all those you have taken or olecranon process okay tone then come to the tone tone is increased in upper and lower uh, limb at the left side clasp knife uh, clasp knife rigidity is present on the left side uh, at what the, the other joint. Type, what are the other types of rigidity seen besides clasp knife sir uh, kogan uh, wheel and lead uh, pipe sorry sorry kogan wheel and lead pipe hello kogan it is cog wheel uh, cog so, oh, sorry sir cog wheel and lead pipe lead pipe so what is the difference sir in lead pipe there is a resistance throughout and in cog wheel there is a resistant at a repeated uh, intervals in the movement and then in clasp knife in clasp knife there is sir uh, resist, uh, re resistance in the starting of the movement uh, and then in it didn't give away okay that's clasp knife and this lead pipe you said throughout there is resistance yes and yes. and cog wheel you say interrupted interrupted you know resistance then goes gives way then resistance yes sir so what type of lesions cog wheel rigidity occurs what type of disease yes Same extra Parkinson. pyramidal extra pyramidal. extra pyramidal very classical of a extra pyramidal which are like seen in parkinsons Parkinson. or other those diseases okay okay uh, motor power you have written left side 3 by 5 in upper and lower limb so it is not a significant weakness so you cannot call it hemiplegia it is hemiparesis left sided hemiparesis paresis okay yes the power is still 3 by 5 that means the muscle what do you mean by 3 against against muscle gravity. can act against the gravity can against the gravity okay what about then uh, how you come to gait now okay circumduction gait okay yes sir and no involuntary movements okay okay so this 3 by 5 five power is at all joints in upper and lower limb yes sir at at shoulder at elbow at wrist all joints yes sir in upper limb there there was fever the shoulder uh, what kind of abduction adduction or uh, everywhere it is 3 by 5 in upper yes 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 or no yes sir, sir in the shoulder and the elbow joint and at the wrist uh so you have to say everywhere all the three major joints okay yes okay come to sense system a sensory examination a two point discrimination 2 mm on pulp of the finger and 68 mm on the back tactile mm -hmm. localization is intact stereognosis is in, intact pain and temperature and se sensation intact vibration mm -hmm. sense normal with 128 hertz so, every, is, no, so there is no sensory involvement no sir okay so neither there is a loss of uh, peripheral sensation nor the cortical sensation what are the other cortical sensations you know of besides tactile localization and stereognosis can you name them one other is called as tactile discrimination two point discrimination test localization is just putting one point or one finger at one place and person is able to localize it is now sir it is on the uh, palmar aspect or it is on the uh, say palmar aspect of my this thing uh, forearm the finger but if you put two fingers on the same place ideally on the finger tip it is the closest the two fingers as close as you put and they can even distinguish that there are two fingers put 
all right so this is called as tactile discrimination okay so localization yes. discrimination stereognosis and anything else graphics no there is one more okay go ahead no problem next Reflexes. reflexes yes sir corneal reflex mm -hmm. uh, reflex blinking uh, occurs on touching the cornea with whisk of uh, wisp of cotton plantar reflex on left side babinski positive that is extensor uh, reflex and on right side babinski negative or normal that is flexor or normal reflex uh, deep tendon reflexes biceps reflex or triceps uh, supinator reflex on the left hand side is brisk on the right hand side is normal three plus reflect. you said three yes, plus ye yes. three plus ka kya matlab hota hai it's a it's on grading scale uh, we tell about the reflexes what are the various grading scale please tell me Sir, uh, on zero there is no reflex hmm uh, one there is the slightly uh, very low reflex and two normal third brisk right one sorry Sorry, grade one is. Uh, sir, mild reflex, like very lightly reacting, flickering. Mild. Mild reflex. Okay, and grade two is normal. Grade three is brisk. Yes, sir. and fourth is clonus. Fourth is clonus. Okay. So left side all reflexes are brisk. Right side yes. they are normal. Yes. Okay, next. what order have you chosen to present why should not have reflexes come earlier why should not have come earlier than gait and abnormal movement so this is not the correct order you present first muscle bulk then tone then power then reflexes then you come to some even suggest the standard textbooks would suggest after that sensory system then Uh, abnormal movement then gait and then skeletal and spine that is the correct order of presenting the case so i don't know which book you are following if you follow macloids if you follow hutchinson these are the correct ways not reflex is not coming at the end is not right what my point okay okay yes sir yes sir next Uh, respiratory examination respiratory is okay next next cardiovascular normal okay abdominal examination normal okay so before you go to summary what happened to his uh, this thing uh, what about coordination Did you speak about coordination in the beginning? Go back to your slide of examination. Scroll back. Yeah. Go back. Go back. Go back. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Just. Yeah. Next. 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 No. No. You're going back. Come. Yeah. Don't go. Yeah. Yeah. next where is the sorry come back get get one yeah where is the coordination that you for completely forgot can you test the coordination cerebellar signs yes sir finger nose test this desire coordination no well, so with the power grade 3 you can always test the coordination yes sir all right so you missed out on this that's why i tell you after motor power you should first go to sensory sorry reflexes then you should go to sensory system then you should go to coordination involuntary movement gait this is the order sir to check the right. coordination test sorry 
sir, for checking the coordination. Don't we need the muscle power four out of five? No, no, no. Three you can check when you say okay. it is able to move against gravity or not. Yes, sir. So that is three power is good enough. If it is power less than three, then you cannot. And right sided, you could have already tested. Right side coordination to normal. Hota. Yes, sir. Because there are cases where there is a condition called as ataxic hemiparesis. Yes, sir. All right. So it brings back memory to my my post graduation days 40 years back. When I got a case of ataxic hemiparesis in my MD exam. All right. So there was ataxia and hemiparesis both in an individual. All right. So very, very important that you test coordination. Okay. And you know what was the cause of that ataxic hemiparesis? Sir, it was a case of ataxic hemiparesis following malaria leading to vasculitis in the brain producing as ataxic hemiparesis. Okay. So coordination testing is very important, which you should not miss. If you say power is great less than if three or above, then you have to say about coordination. Okay. Yes. Sir. You are not speaking with conviction. You are not happy with what I said. Yes, sir. sir like, uh, Thank you. Problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Summary. Mr. X, a gentleman, 60 years old, male, uh, is a uh, known case of hypertension. Yeah. Uh, uh, is a known case of hypertension presented with weakness in left upper and lower limb and the tongue deviation uh, to, uh, and mouth uh, uh, and deviation of angle of the mouth towards the right side, slurring of speech for the past six days on neurological examination. Uh, increased mm -hmm. tone and uh, brisk deep reflexes on left upper and lower limbs are present. All right. Next. Probable diagnosis. This is not uh, complete hemiplegia. It's hemiparesis. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With seventh and twelfth nerve involvement, which are upper motor neuron type you will have to write okay so region is at the level of internal capsule involving genu and posterior limb that's fine likely steology is thrombotic thrombo okay yes sir all the reticular stride branch of the middle cerebral artery okay okay any and any other slide you have next so what are the investigation you are going to do to confirm your diagnosis What will be one if you are allowed to do only one investigation, whatever it may be? All possible investigations are available. CT angiography. Sorry? Even MR angiography would be better. Okay. Yes. MR angiography would be much better. Why? No radiation exposure. All right. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And yes, sir. delineation of lesions are much, much more better with MR than with the CT. Okay. Yes, sir. The answer is CT and is not wrong, but when I said everything is available, that would have been better. And even better would have been MR angiography with perfusions, perfusion imaging. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, so what is the treatment for this patient now? Of course, you will do all other basic biochemistry investigation, ECG. All right, maybe an echo also to see whether there is, if the ECG does not show any evidence of left ventricle hypertrophy. You can do an echo to confirm whether this is a long standing hypertension or not to see echo. And you can also do a retina examination, fundus examination to see whether there is hypertensive retinopathy or not. Just to reconfirm that there is a long standing hypertension. Okay. okay? Yes. 
why it is important to know long standing hypertension okay leave some questions for md okay let's you have so can i now present something or you have another case sir that's it do you have have you prepared any other case paraplegia also no sir no okay no problem so we'll now stop sharing your screen so i'll start sharing my screen okay sir sir okay. there were a few doubts uh, asked ask questions on the chat or you are asking me you can ask me the what is written in the chat or doubts please ask sir you of our friends messaged us to ask yeah yeah go ahead yes sir Uh, is it possible to differentiate between central and peripheral dysarthria on the basis of history? Yes. Tell me how. Guess. Make some guess. Make some guess. Rishikesh, repeat the question, sir. Sorry. Sir, I told Rishikesh to repeat the question. Voice. Uh, Sorry, is it sorry, possible, sir? sir? She said to repeat the question. Yeah, the question is: Is it possible to distinguish on the basis of history whether the person has got peripheral dysarthria or central dysarthria? So the answer lies to that in question in history: How did it start? What were the precipitating events? All right. yes if you are thinking that the patient has on history a upper motor neuron lesion then obviously it is a central dysarthria so the whole history which you take gives you the clue what my point if you think patient has got bulbar palsy the history would be different versus the pseudo bulbar palsy so that it cannot be in isolation only that for dysarthria i have this it is the total picture you have to take you got my point yes yes so if it if you are thinking right from the beginning a internal capsule lesion in this patient then it is bound to be a central dysarthria if i think that there is a lesion in the spinal cord at the cervical level upper high cervical level or there is a lesion in the medulla all right there will be a cross hemiplegia okay yes whenever there is a lesion in brain stem cranial nerve gets involved on one side and paralysis occurs on the other side hemiplegia occurs on the opposite side call is crossed cross hemiplegia hemiplegia if that is the situation then the lesion may be a said peripheral dysarthria what my point nucleus and below when nucleus or below structures get involved then it will always produce a lower motor neuron type of cranial nerve involvement what my point yes so that is the picture you have to take for that any other questions other questions please if none then i can i start my slide can you see my slide yes looks like are you able to see yes sir okay so uh i'll cut down on all these what i have prepared go to the base so this all you know hemiplegia can be congenital also acquired also all right and hemiplegia is more severe than hemiparesis as i told you all right and as i told in the beginning hemiplegia is total paralysis okay yes sir and signs and symptoms you all know all this i don't need to increasing stiffness of the muscle there may sometimes be muscle spasms difficulty with speech we were talking about already dysarthria and all that difficulty in balance and standing difficulty with gait all right and it varies from person to person individual to individual and depending on site of lesion how much is the area involved then all these cranial nerve symptoms may be there there may be behavior problems all right and most important which we do not 
pay any heed to is a lot of emotional aspect comes in. Depression also sets in. Then causes, as we told you, can be cerebrovascular accident, which can be thrombosis, hemorrhage, or TIA. A trauma, head trauma can produce it. Hematomas following trauma. Dots paralysis classically following seizures. Or chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, all which produces atherosclerosis and gradually narrowing of cerebral circulation, carotids and all that. So either a plaque from their ruptures and blocks a vessel deep inside. All right. That can occur. Or there is an embolization from an enlarged heart. That enlarged heart more classically occurs with valvular lesions when there is a left atrial enlargement, classically in mitral stenosis, atrial fibrillation, and all that produces embolic stroke. All right, so all those may. Brain tumor can produce hemiparesis. Vasculitis, as I told you, my case of malaria producing vasculitis and hemiplegia and ataxia together. Subdural empyema. As you were saying, meningitis, yes. <laughs> Meningitis can also produce hemiplegia by vasculitis or by meningitis causing infarct by vasculitis or meningitis leading to brain abscess and brain abscess causing lesion in the brain causing hemiplegia like a brain tumor. Then, uh, uh, then you may have hereditary diseases, leukodystrophies, and this is wrong relating here, acute necrotizing myelitis. So, I mean, this is more for uh paraplegia then by etiology if you look into the causes nervous system by large you should have six or seven etiology for any illness infective as happens with anyone inflammatory not as infective separate what you call as vasculitis comes under inflammatory then you have the most common Vascular, then neoplastic, like tumors. Demyelinating disorder, classical example is multiple sclerosis. All right. Then you have traumatic. Then you have congenital, like cerebral palsy. Then you may have terminated, I would call more demyelinating. And then you have one classical. So now this psychological nocturnal hemiplegia, this is a very a rare thing and not have I've not seen any of those. And one of the most important cause of degenerative disorder, generally not producing hemiplegia, but they produce sometimes they produce more of paraplegia are degenerative disorders like motor neuron disease. They produce more of a paraplegia or quadriplegia, all right, rather than hemiplegia. Six eight one Sorry, sorry for this interruption. So exact cause is not known. We know brain cells are deprived of oxygen. All right. And death of neurons. So when corticospinal tract is damaged, of course, side, that is what happens in classically hemiplegia. All right. So depending on the side, this happens. All right. Then semiplegia, as I already told you, complete loss of muscle power. This is how the lesion would look into. Like here is the lesion. All right. CT scan of the perfusion scan. These are. All right. So perfusion scan showing dense perfusion here here but there is lack of perfusion on this area it is here perfused here is no perfusion here acute onset vascular infective and traumatic visual onset are neoplastic or brain abscess and remitting relapsing are classically like multiple sclerosis all right so we do ct and mr and all that now csct scan showing fuse here all right then you see a complete cutoff of the vessel left middle cerebral artery completely occluded here it is going 
here side. Treatment you all know. Pharmacological rehabilitation, most important is physiotherapy. And of course, rarely surgery like in brain abscess or subdural hematoma or large main, main bleed, large bleed in the brain. There you may have to cannot me. Prognosis again depends on what kind of disease. Embolic stroke generally have a good prognosis. While thrombotic and bleed uh, recovery is little slow. So this is a 45 year old female agriculture worker presents with abrupt onset deviation of angle of mouth to left side and weakness of both right upper and lower limb for 10 12 days she had attended a funeral function and had was a lot of had a lot of stress suddenly had giddiness within few hours the lift is found she was lying floppy on the bed was unconscious not responding to call not moving any limb with deviation of angle of mouth towards left on way there was abnormal jerky movements of all limbs lasted for a few minutes on way from there to the hospital there was a frothing discharge from the mouth and involuntary passage of the urine thereby suggesting she must have had seizures admitted in ice view catheterized nasogastric tube put lifted to ward after three days three days back drowsy not oriented to place or person Unable to move right upper and lower limb, but opens her left eyes when called. Speech output was nil except for some grunting sounds. Not able to open a right eye, history of fecal incontinence, but no history of fever, headache, or physical vomiting or neck stiffness. Since a young patient has this history, no history of any nasal regurgitation. But she did give history 22 years back of fever and joint pains. And six months back, she started having gradual onset dyspnea, NYSA class 2, which progressed, got aggravated, all right, to NYSA 3. And there, she started having palp irregular palpitations, even at test. 13 years back, she was detected to have a valvular heart disease, was advised surgery, she did not do. They were put on potassium, beta blocker, diuretics, and also advised to reduce aggression and emotional stress. 20 days before admission, she had stopped all medication for no reasons known. All right, no recurrent fever, sore throat, history of hypertension passed for 20 years on medication, no history of diabetes, TB, or seizures, no history of similar weakness. Father hypertensive and diabetic, stroke two years back, mother died when she was two years old, cause is not known, father buried again, two children, so the, uh, the young child had valvular surgery at three years, surgery done, now asymptomatic, and now she's 15 years, married at the age of 12, three children, and this thing done for 20 years, well, family sterilization. Personal history, mixed diet, sleep is okay, before the onset of symptoms, better incontinence present after the onset of symptoms, no drug addiction or alcohol addiction, lives in a safe bedroom house. All right, water pass sanitation facilities are good, middle class according to Kupu Swami. General examination like pain on the back, drowsy but responds to painful stimuli and localizes it, moderately built and nourished. Beller and clubbing grade one, no lymphadenopathy, no pedal edema. Nasogastric tube is there, bladder is catheterized, and there are IV cannula on both the hands. Pulse is 103, but it is irregularly irregular with apex deficit of 13. Variable volume, vessel wall is okay, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. All peripheral pulses are equal. Blood pressure is normal. The 
hospital rate is very high and patient is fibrile. Nervous system, lying supine on the bed with right shoulder affected, the extended elbow, forearm pronated, finger slightly flexed, left shoulder slightly abducted, forearm flexed, the elbow, finger slightly flexed. Right lower limb extended, detected, and externally rotated at hip, knee extended and foot plantar flex. Left lower, lower limb in adduction and flex position. Please preference is to prefer to the left side. Higher mental function, drowsy, eye opening three, verbal one, motor response. So, Glasgow coma is nine, not oriented to time, place, and person. Nil speech output, memory intelligence cannot be tested, right handed person. These are the findings of olfactory obstructing oculometric vehicle now. All right, is the on look okay? Eyes animal, fifth nerve is okay, seventh nerve shows angle of mouth David to left, nasophone absent on the right, grimace absent on the right, eighth nerve is okay. Motor system, bulk looks okay. Tone, hypotonia on the right side. Our right upper limb grade zero, lower limb also zero. Left upper limb, all normal and lower limb. Reflexes, right side are brisk, but no clonus. All right, plantar, no response. On left side, all are okay, and plantar is flexor. Primitive reflex is absent, sensory system and coordination cannot be assessed because she is not responding. No peripheral nerve thickening, skull is quite normal, no carotid. This can even come in cardiovascular examination, it can come into sometimes general physical examination also. And carotid fluid is important in a patient of amplegia from point of view of knowing is there any significant atherosclerosis and blockage in the main carotid from where. Many times in elderly patients, the embolization goes or from produces stroke. Cardiovascular system uh, FX impulse not visible. All right, no other positive finding on inspection. Palpation GVP is not raised, but FX PT is at the left of the costal space, so it is down, not in the fifth. Mid clavicular line slightly down and out, tapping in character. There is left parasternal impulse, but no heave, no thrill. Left cardiac border corresponds to the apex, second left because the space resonant, liver dullness present in the right space, so all look okay. Mitral area first heart sound loud, second normal with normal spit. No third and fourth heart now. Low pitch diastolic grumbling murmur, grade three, the apex. Low radiation. Best start with bell of stroke. Bell of stethoscope with patient lying in left foot position at the height of expiration, and there is an opening stem. So classical mitral stenosis. Pulmonary area. Both sounds are normal. No third and fourth sound, no murmur. Trachea is okay, but central respiratory system is okay. Except that there are bilateral basal peptides, which suggest heart failure. GI system okay. So here is a 45 year old lady with history of rheumatic fever, 22 years back. Gradually progressive dyspnea palpitation six months later. Detected to have cardiac disease 18 years back on radical medication, but had stopped all her drugs for last 20 days. Also hypertensive and also has developed orthopnea and BND for last three four months. 20 days back, see, stopped all that abrupt onset of this weakness. All right, and bladder bowel involvement. On examination, clubbing grade one, pulse irregular. All right, GCS nine, as I told you, and all this we have talked about. 
angle of devi deviation to the mouth and hypotonia and which reflexes on the right side and plantar mu. Cardiovascular suggest uh, mitral disease. So the diagnosis is CVA, right-sided hemiplegia with right upper mandibular on patient palsy, most likely embolic in origin, involving left middle cerebral artery. Later opening from neuronal shock as well, sensorium is improving. Most likely valvular heart disease, mitral stenosis, hematic in etiology with atrial fibrillation and systemic hypertension. But no classical features of congestive cardiac failure or infective endocarditis, right? Or pulmonary hypertension or atrial fibrillation. No, sorry. And no features of cardiac failure, infective endocarditis, and pulmonary arterial hypertension. But diagnosis, we should also add here atrial fibrillation because of irregular pulse. These were the investigations. Okay, some leukocytosis with polymorphs, 88%. There is some albumin in the urine. There are some RBCs there. In the uh, rest all look all right, except I as UOT. PTINR is also high. Random blood sugar is high. This is the X-ray classical mitralization of the left side. See this? Heart. So this is the first thing is found by aorta, then pulmonary artery, then the left atrium, and then the left ventricle. So this is generally this shape is like this. The shape generally should be like this, but here there is prominent pulmonary artery. That means pulmonary artery. So after aorta, pulmonary artery is prominent. That says the pulmonary artery position may be there. Left it is also enlarged. That's why there is one straightening of the left quad. You see, I think you can't see this in patient fibrillation. And here you can see a lesion or fart in the left side producing a right sided MEPG. Can you see this here? In the CT scan, non contrast CT. She was given decongestion, manitol, antibiotics, probably because of high leukocytes, or probably she had aspirated. And those repetitions could also be because of the you know, aspiration rather than because of frank heart failure. She was given all these therapy and she's gradually improved. All right. So any questions you have? So you showed me a case of hypertension, classical thrombotic episode here is an embolization most likely because of atrial fibrillation because of an underlying acquired valvular heart disease which is very very common and these are the patients in addition to this therapy once they are discharged they will be put on anticoagulant because of atrial fibrillation of course the drugs to control heart rate like beta blockers and desoxin also need to be given but uh, anticoagulant it will be a must to prevent these episodes of stroke again. If you have no, any other question, then I yeah, please go ahead. Sir, there is a question: How to differentiate between thrombotic stroke and embolic stroke? The uh, very difficult, but history-wise, if you have evidence that there is some source of embolization like acquired valvular heart disease or even congenital heart disease or you have already existing arrhythmia in a patient with ischemic heart disease all right that history is very very important that's when the embolization occurs okay in absence of that history the positive uh, the history where you have sudden onset of a weakness and early resolution of those symptoms suggest a embolic stroke if it exceeds beyond 24 hours before 24 hours it is tia all right and the tia classically can occur even with not necessarily embolization can also occur with a, a, a rupture of a plaque from a carotid going up there so that also goes as an embolization 
all right, and blocks a smaller vessel like lenticular striated branch and then produces the lesion. Yes. So history is very important. Associated uh, conditions patient has are important. And third and most important is again with embolization, your absence of history of seizures, absence of history of loss of consciousness. But again, that depends if, if the, the lesion is too big involving the cortex, all these features would also occur. And a rapid recovery is much, much more common in embolization. Otherwise, we do not have much answer to it. All right. But then there is one more school of thought which says that the episodes of embolization occurs while you are resting or they are occurring while or they are occurring while you are inactive active so the school of thought is that if you have bleed hemorrhage as a cause of stroke generally it is during activity all right yes but these are all ifs and buts there is no 100 percent answer to that i'll skip that soap analysis is wrong with that. any other question no, sir. Sorry? No, sir. Not uh, no one any other question. So I'm skipping all these treatment part and all this lifestyle and all that. This is very important. Face, arms, speech, and time. And that suggests that there is stroke occurring. So let's talk about paraplegia now in the next half an hour or so. All right. Uh, uh, so impairment in motor or sensory function of the lower extremities all right this is a general term for paraplegia both upper plus both lower limbs becomes quadriplegia only one limb becomes monoplegia maybe one upper limb or one lower limb all right and paraplegia is both lower limbs it can be spastic, flaccid, then it can be paraplegia and extension, paraplegia and flexion. Paraplegia and extension is lower limbs take generally an extensor attitude when they are paraplegic. Only pyramidal tracts are involved and very early evolution. In flexion means lower limbs take an attitude of flexion. Both pyramidal and extrapendal tracts are involved and there is a late evolution in these what are the causes of spastic paraplegia human type gradual onset can be cerebral causes like cerebral diplegia or parasitical meningioma as you see a meningioma here but again they are very extremely uncommon causes all right one common cause we see is cerebral palsy where there is paraplegia okay spinal causes are compressive non-compressive Amongst non-compressive, the more common one are motor neuron disease, subacute combined degeneration because of vitamin B12 deficiency, demyelinating disorder like multiple sclerosis, or degenerative disorders like Frederick's ataxia. There are many more. Amongst the compressive, you can see epidural, intradural, or intramedullary neoplasm, epidural abscess, epidural hemorrhage patient with severe cervical spondylosis may come with paraplegia or quadriplegia, disc herniation, post-traumatic compression by fracture or displaced vertebra or hemorrhage there, vascular AV malformation or antiphospholipid syndrome and hypercoagulable states can be causes for vascular, inflammatory, multiple sclerosis, classical acute viral transverse myelitis which we see very commonly neuromyelitis optica is a variant of multiple sclerosis sarcoidosis and then again vasculitis like jogren's related myelopathy systemic lupus sle related other small vessel vasculitis following infection following hiv hiv myelopathy varizola uh, hsv or varicella, just virus, 
HDLV. Some bacterial infections like TB, very common for paraplegia. We know one of the important causes of paraplegia in the country is tubercular myelitis, tubercular pot spine, lot many things. Then really syphilis is now coming back because of advent of HI, otherwise it is not there. These layer causes like Borrelia, Listeria, Mycoplasma. Some parasitic infection like cysticercosis, toxoplasmosis, cystosomiasis, very, very rare. We do see sometimes cystosercosis, we do see toxoplasmosis because of HIV and immunocompromised patients we see. Then some developmental disorder of the spinal cord like syringomyelia, meningomyelocele, or tethered port syndrome. And as I showed you, subacute combined degeneration, vitamin B12, and some copper deficiency. Amongst the compressive etiology, which are intramedullary, are only 5%. They may be glioma, ependymoma, or pardoma, like this region here, all right, in the brain tumors. So these tumors are occurring in the spinal cord. All right. Extramedullary, which can be intradural or extradural. Amongst the intradural would be meningioma, neurofibroma, or arachnoiditis because of TB. Very common in this part of the world. Extradural, which are more common, 80%. TB spine, lymphoma, myeloma, metastatic deposits in the vertebra, patchy meningitis, or prolapse intervertebral disc. So, sudden onset cerebral causes, very rare. Thrombosis of unpaired anti-cerebral artery, very, very rare. I have never seen a case. But this superior sagittal sinus thrombosis, we have seen a lot many. Some patients with post-delivery. So this is very common. We see patients with cortical venous thrombosis following post-delivery because of hypercoagulable state. Yes, we do see. But coming with paraplegia are uncommon but they do come with these sometimes. Spinal causes, just to repeat, acute transverse myelitis is top of the list. Trauma, spinal cord, hematomyelia, post-vaccinal, yes, very important to take you, post-dog bite, rabies vaccination, or post-other vaccine, you may have myelitis, by paraplegia, prolapse disc, as I told you earlier. Flaccid paraplegia, that means you person has the upper neural region but he's in a stage of shock which may last for a few weeks or sudden onset in neuronal shock acute transverse myelitis spinal injury which occurs in human lesion element lesion involving anterior horn cell or peripheral nerves acute anterior poliomyelitis which is practically eradicated now acute infective polyneuropathy very common AIDP or Gulenberry syndrome you heard of and really a progressive muscular atrophy. Then diseases affecting the posterior nerve root, rabies dorsalis, again syphilis and all that, very uncommon but can be seen. Diseases which affect the myoneural junction, like myasthenia gravis, or periodic paralysis due to hypo or hyperkalemia. So we do see some cases of hypokalemic periodic paralysis coming with paraplegia. Then really the myopathy and hysterical paralysis. This is affecting the muscles. So these five T's you need to remember. Trauma, tumor, tuberculosis, thrombosis, and transverse myelitis. Just analyzing them and rather than having the whole list, if you think of these five as causes of paraplegia. So what are the signs which distinguish between upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, and myopathic things? Atrophy is seen very severely in element type of lesion, but again, it will take a few weeks before it sets in. Upper motor neuron may occur if there is complete paralysis lasting for weeks and months, and disuse atrophy sets in here, but more common in element very minimal in myopathic, psychogenic, you will not find any wasting. Very important. Fasciculations, mainly seen in lower motor neuron, that is spontaneous contractions of the muscle, not in other conditions. 
tone, upper motor neuron is spastic. Generally, in other conditions, it is decreased. Myopathic may be normal or decreased. Psychogenic can be variable and paratonic. Distribution of weakness, generally in pyramidal or regional level. Here, it will be distal or segmental level. Myopathy would be more of a proximal weakness. Here, it is inconsistent. All right, so they will keep on changing these weakness, sometimes in upper limbs, sometimes in lower limbs, sometimes on only hands. Muscle reflexes, generally hyperactive. Here they are generally absent or hypoactive. It's not wrongly written as hyperactive. Normal or hypoactive and normal. Levinsky, extensor, rest of the places it would be flexor or absent. Sometimes it can be absent here also, but generally it is Levinsky present. So very thing, all other thing you have to remember with spinal level and vertebral level is what is the spinal cord level and what is the vertebral level. If the regions in the upper cervical that is above C5, then the levels are same. Upper cervical same as cord level. If there is a lower cervical region, then one level higher. That means if it is C5 lesion, then the, uh, the vertebral body would be C4. If it is upper thoracic, that is from T1 to T6, then two levels higher. So if there is T3 spinal cord level, then the lesion would be at the T1 level, vertebral level. Lower thoracic, two to three levels higher. Lumbar region, T10 to T12 and sacral region T12 to L1 because the spinal cord ends at the L1 level. So this is very easy to remember. Now just let's discuss one case of paraplegia and then I'll call it a day. Uh, presenting complaint is backache for one month, swelling in the right cheek for 15 days, Hoarseness of voice for 15 days, reduced sensation in lower limbs, 10 days, inability to reuse lower limbs, 8 days, incontinence of urine and feces, difficulty in lifting hands above shoulders, and deviation of angle of mouth to left side. All right. So, this was the presenting complaint, chief complaints of this patient. So, there is backache. Swelling in the right cheek, hoarseness of the voice, reduced sensation in lower limb, inability to move lower limbs, incontinence, five days. Then there is difficulty lifting hands above shoulders and deviation of angle to the left side. 29-year-old male, diagnosed as SPSAG positive, had complained of backache for one month. Insidious, persistent, dull aching quality, pain remitted occasionally, but was very severe during nights when he laid on the bed, when he lied down on the bed. This gradually increased in severity and was disturbing his daily routine from past 20 days. Pain radiated down along the thighs and such radiation of pain aggravated on activities. History of swelling in the right cheek from past 10 days. Insidious in appearance, but decreasing in size. Swelling was never painful, not associated with difficulty in opening mouth or was painful during eating mouth. Initially had complaints of clumsiness during walking with difficulty standing from straight position. Had such problems since 20, 30 days, but from past 10 days, he progressively felt more difficulty in performing his daily routine. Was bedridden with only flicker of movements in the right lower limb at presentation. Patient had hoarseness of voice for last 15 days. Sudden onset persistent and no aggravating or relieving factor. Associated with occasional difficulty in breathing and noising respiration. History of band-like sensation around umbilicus. No history of fever, cough, and expectoration. No history of chest pain, palpitation, and dyspnea. No history of headache, loss of consciousness, syncope, seizures, altered sensorium. 
no history of wasting of fasciculation, no history of involuntary movements. In past, he had hepatitis six months back, but was not on any treatment as there was no disease activity, active disease going on. No history of chronic diseases, personal history, occasional smoker, alcoholic, family history, no other relevant illness in the family. On general examination, conscious oriented, not anemic, not jaundiced, no sinuses, no clubbing. All right, pulse 86, blood pressure okay, cardiovascular respiratory system normal, multiple lymph node enlargement, upper cervical, matted, not tender, firm inconsistency, as big as four centimeter in size, right supraclavicular lymph nodes, left lower deep cervical lymph nodes, right and left axillary lymph nodes, medial and apical group, inguinal group growth, and last thyroid, firm consistency, smooth surface, parotid and last firm consistency, non-tender lobulated surface on the right side. This is how he looked like. Can you see the nodes here? Can you see the right side swelling? And slight deviation of the angle of mouth, you can see. This is the position of the limb externally rotated, extended. Can you see this swelling here of lymph nodes, parotid? Higher mental function was normal. MMSC was more than 25. No cognitive impairment, impairment speech comprehension good, although some hoarseness present. Kilner nerve, right lower motor neuron type of facial palsy. Right lower motor type glossopharyngeal palsy, right vocal cord palsy. So this is classically a kind of a bulbar palsy. Lower motor neuron type, 9th, 10th involvement. Rest of the cranial nerves were normal. On motor system examination, tone was upper limb normal, lower limb flaccid, bulk normal, power upper limb 4 by 5, Lower limb 1 by 5 or 0 by 5, right and left side. Reflexes, biceps uh, uh, present. They were, uh, biceps were present, triceps were present, but ankle and knee were absent, both sides, and plantar bilateral, no response. All superficial reflexes absent, like abdominal, cremestric, and uh, the and uh, the sorry um, uh, abnormal reflex domestic reflex they were absent so they were suggestive of paraplegia sensory examination had normal perception of all sensation up to the level of one centimeter above umbilicus so above umbilicus there was normal perception at and below this reduced sensitive to pain and vibration and temperature. Pubic, below pubic surfaces and lower limb, including the saddle region, absent perception of vibration, pain, temperature, fine touch. Investigation revealed normal hemogram. All right, slight reduced MCH. Kidney functions were normal, liver functions were normal. Thyroid had slightly Elevated TSS, but not significant. HIV negative, HVSSG positive, SCV negative. Ultrasound abdomen pelvis showed hepatomegaly with minimal ascites. Pericardial and pleural effusion, all of that was present. Chest x ray normal. MRI strain, CT thorax, CT abdomen were done. You can see that. So liver is slightly enlarged. Let it slide. Minimal ascites and milieu fluid. You see the examination of the spinal cord here. The next picture you would see what is happening to the vertebrae, like here. You can see these, these hypodensities here, or these densities here, or here. See it more prominently now here, here, these. Like these. 
peripheral myths where normal cystic thrombocytic anemia, bone marrow normal, serum LDH was high. Cervical lymph node FNAC revealed Hodgkin's lymphoma, excision biopsy, suggestive anaplastic last cell lymphoma, all right, and cervical lymph node excision biopsy, high grade malignant lymphoma with features such as last cell lymphoma. This is how it looked like. All right, look at this. Huge numbers. So all these people were consulted. The diagnosis was generalized lymphopathy, compressive myelopathy, SPCC positive, and his histological diagnosis was anaplastic last cell lymphoma with metastatic epidural spinal cord compression syndrome. All those in the vertebrae were saying were metastasis. So what is metastatic epidural spinal cord syndrome? I think we can skip that. Location of metastatic lesion of spinal cord generally. All right, so you have a vertebra, you have it here. Most common site is thoracic spine, which you were seeing in our cases. 30% in the lumbosic region, 10% cervical region. All right, most common is thoracic. Back pain is classical. Motor and autonomic dysfunction may occur. Sensory finding again. Uh, there will always be a spinal level present when and of the classical Lermet's phenomena, the experience of electricity down the spine with neck flexion, generally seen in the multiple sclerosis, cervical myelopathy, chemotherapy induced neurotoxicity, radiation induced neck trauma, and rarely with epidural or subdural neoplasm. So if you have this myelopathy, how do you proceed and all that, that's okay. So differential diagnosis of those would be musculoskeletal disease, spinal neurolapses, metastatic disease. All right, we do see radiation myelopathy also, and some rare causes, and vasculitis and other we were talking about. So this patient had a metastatic disease producing paraplegia. On the other hand, you can have other patient with classical acute transverse myelitis spinal shock, which is the most common cause of paraplegia we see. And most of them it is post viral, but these are the important causes in that. They will be following a extradural tumor with bleed, transverse myelitis, spot spine, epidural abscess, or disc prolapse. This is what you see here. See it here? Can you see the lesion here? Can you see it in here? And they produce altered spinal cord signal intensity, multiple vertebral body level. You had that D12, L4, L5, S1. And there was extensive SOAS collection. This was the case of epidural abscess. And when they investigated, it came out to be tubercular. It was put on ATT. His abscess was drained and he improved. So I'll end it here uh, by saying that in paraplegia, the most important uh, history which you need to take is again, in any case, as you take in any case, is how does the patient present it? Is it acute presentation, subacute presentation, chronic presentation? What is the age of the patient? What is the underlying illness patient has? Is there any history of trauma? Is there any history to suggest infection? Is there any history to suggest a degenerative disorder? Is there any history to suggest uh, vasculitis or history to suggest a cerebrovascular accident? 
all those may be causes of paraplegia also in these patients. All right. As I showed you, the most common site for transverse myelitis is thoracolumbar. All right. Some it can involve generally three to four vertebra. Can it sometimes be pan spinal? All right. And this is how you diagnose them. You don't now need to do a CSF in most of the cases, but yes, when we want to be more specific and aggressive in trying to find out, we may do that. CT myelography is now is done, but even an MR can help you. So are not able to do a CT myelography. It is much more, more common when you want to do a surgery or MR with gadolinium scan is much better. And these are the differential diagnoses you would think of when there is a transverse myelitis. So any other questions you have, please ask me or write in your chat. Priyansh or anyone, uh, I don't know how to oh, send your attendance. I don't know how do I select all this. Can anyone please respond? Yes, sir. Yeah, how do I send your attendance? Any questions? There are no more questions, but I will ask Priyansh for the attendance. Priyansh is a VIP person. He responds most of the time. So when are you due for your exams? This this December? Yes, sir. Most likely. Sorry, fi final prof exam you are due for this November, December? Yes, sir. Most likely. Most likely. No, I think it will be held in that time now. Hopefully. How many, how many of you are vaccinated? How many of you are vaccinated? Almost all. Almost all. Okay, so how do I send your uh, how do I send your attendance? How do I select that? I'm not able to do it. Last time also I could not. Sorry? Priyansh isn't responding, right? Ask. Sorry? Sir, there is all 125 of us are present, so... It's showing 123. Anyhow, doesn't matter. Two as a bonus. Two members can be bonus. <laughs> Anyhow, so all are present. I'll write that. But yes. I think they want an electronic evidence. I don't know. Uh, first, we have been telling them to change it to go to meeting rather than webinar so that we can have more interaction. But I don't know. They are all sleeping on it. That is the way. Anyhow, all the best. Then. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm calling it a day then. Okay. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Stop broadcast. And and webinar for all.